sign that people are at least tolerating the experience. It's not really <laughs> so I, if that, I'm using that as a, uh, you may not be if you're having a horrible time, but I'm getting the message that you're having a good time. If you're not having a good time, let me know. Um, in the meantime, uh, however, uh, yes. No, no, no. <laughs> Uh, you have the ability to affect your time in a moment. <laughs> I've never had such a great interchange with the speakers about to introduce them. This is the very, very famous National Research Council scientist, Dr. Steve, I mean, not, no, Steve no, Dapp, not Dr. Sorry, Mr. Stephen Downs, um, who has come to us. And I, I will tell you, my first experience with Stephen Downs was many, many years ago. I was involved with this group that... Um, we did predictions on the future of e-learning in the coming year. And my first year I got from the expert here, a D plus. The next year I got D plus. <laughs> but Stephen has this unique way of really getting at the heart of what is going on with technology and how it can be applied to teaching and instruction. I think what's also notable, Stephen's been really at the forefront of some of the most significant developments in technology in our field, even pre-AI. Um, for example, one of the very first MOOCs was co-facilitated by his students. And so without any further ado, I would like to turn the podium over to Stephen Downs. We're going to talk to you about AI and enterprise systems, and we'll work in a little bit of personalized learning in there. So we're going to this way, sorry. Hoping for a wee bit more ado so I could... Oh, I can kill more time if you need it. Well, I'm just trying, but you, you can see my problem. I want to show the slide presentation, but it's it, it's covered oh, it's, by the, you've got it. the screen sharing. Got it right. Oh, right here. This oh, you down. guys are great. Yeah. There you go. You won't be able to get rid of the controls, but you'll be able to awesome. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Um, how long have we got? You have until twelve fifty nine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, whenever. Uh, so, okay. So, I've been given the task of talking about AI and enterprise learning systems, and let's just get a sense. How many of you have knowledge of enterprise learning systems? Yeah, that's kind of what I thought, five, yeah. Um, how many of you have a deep background in AI? Yeah, so you see my challenge. <laughs> um, I decided to do a bit more because I'm like that. And so I'm also going to talk about how to be a futurist, right? So I'm gonna give you some pro tips on how to be a futurist. Uh, can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, everyone can see the screen okay? All right, so this presentation is called AI and Enterprise Learning Systems. Pro tip number one, put a QR code on your screen to the URL where you've put your slides so that people can get the slides without any fuss or muss. So that's where they are. Um, now I discovered about five minutes before the talk that I'd put the uh, PowerPoint slide link in incorrectly. Uh, it should be fixed, but if it's not, just give it time, it'll update. The PDF link is working. So, and after this presentation, at this URL, or following the QR code, you'll be able to get the, uh, the uh, the slides, the audio recording, which is on here, the text transcript, which the audio recording is producing, um, the video recording, which hopefully Zoom is producing, and if we're really lucky, the Zoom recording will have captions. So you'll be able to experience this presentation over and over and over <laughs> again. Um, just, just uh, this is the only AI produced piece in the entire presentation. Um, I asked it. I asked ChatGPT. Uh, 
chat GPT, I began with 4.0, the newly released Omni, which I really think is 3.5 in disguise, personally. I'm not. <laughs> And and I and all it would do is produce regression charts, um, and that's not what I wanted. I, I wanted a diagram of the different capacities of AI, the different capabilities. So I went to Chat GPT four, and this the best it, is the best it could give me. It gave me such gems as ten eight action. <laughs> Dose, <laughs> grainy, Ocity. they're all like real letters. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll be doing this the human generated way for the rest of this presentation. <laughs> I want you to feel free to stop me and ask me any questions as I go through. It's, it's the old thing about these talks, right? This talk isn't for me, um, it's for you. So if it's not working for you, tell me. Uh, it's really important that you do that, otherwise you'll be like not only bored, but bored and disappointed, and I don't want that. We'll just handle bored. And <laughs> so yeah, uh, you know, uh, just fling up a hand, I'll finish my sentence because I'm usually in mid-flight and uh, then address your concern as thoroughly and completely as possible. Sounds good so far? All right. Here's the abstract, which uh, Saul got out of me after much coaxing, <laughs> including a, a desperate email saying, are you okay? <laughs> because, uh, I, I tend to put off preparing presentations to the last possible moments. And that's because, like, you know, things happen in this field. Like, two weeks ago, um, ChatGPT 4.0 did not exist. Now it does. So that's, that's the sort of thing. That's why I put it off. But anyhow, that's the, the presentation um, for the sake of the recording. This presentation will provide a general perspective on the probably use of AI yep. in enterprise learning systems like learning experience platforms, learning management systems, and talent management systems. And what that might mean for learning. We will explore uses including learning and performance analytics, learning and competencies assessment, content and learning path recommendations, and similar types of work. We will also consider how various standards such as XAPI facilitate intelligence in enterprise systems and consider wider issues such as data management and analytics, the enterprise AI workflow, and evolving needs in enterprise learning and development. My managers were very impressed. Uh, that's a mouthful. Um, other way. Here is actually what to expect. I'm gonna kind of keep to the abstract. I don't always. Uh, some they bring me to speak anyways. Um, but uh, this is what I'm up to for this particular presentation. We'll do a bit of an overview of, of the technology and then zoom in on what AI does. Then we'll look at these enterprise learning systems then I'll do an interlude. Like I said, I'm going to talk about how to be a futurist. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually do the predicting. Um, then we're going to actually make some predictions. That'll be the fun part. And then I'll give you a tip about what the pros do to get the big bucks on those <laughs> consulting gigs. Um, you're just going to kick yourself. <laughs> And then look briefly at some wider issues. Saul laughs because he knows. <laughs> All right. So we got to put AI in a context. If you don't put AI in a context, you, oh, I can't wonder. Um, if you don't put AI in a context, you're going to get really confused. 
and just improving the video a bit. Um, because AI depends on a lot of stuff that is not AI. Especially going forward, it's going to depend on a lot of stuff that's not AI. And really, I consider it one of three key technological developments that have happened over the last, I don't know, decade, two decades. Now, as previously mentioned, the history of AI goes back to like prehistory, almost before I was born even. Um, and uh, the same with these other technologies. But they've come together recently, um, especially with ChatGPT and, and stuff like that. But all of this has been years in the making and, and frankly, was fairly easy to see coming. I don't know why everyone's so surprised. I get to say that, but okay. So here's the first, and the first is, surprisingly, the metaverse. You might think, some, what? Goggles on your, well, <clears throat> forget about the goggles on your eyes. Forget about, I mean, the metaverse is virtual reality, extended reality, and all of that. But VR has been around for 20 years. I mean, I played around in a system called Active Worlds when I was young. Or, um, <laughs> you know, so it's, no, what's new and what makes the metaverse interesting is the idea of persistent objects. It's not simply VR, it's that you using VR and somebody else using VR could be working with the very same objects, the very same things, virtual worlds, right? And, and so you're in this environment where, you know, you, if you're playing a game, you're fighting the same monster, you're in the same room, whatever. So persistent objects, that's historically been a challenge, believe it or not, for computing. The metaverse conceptualizes that at least. Still tons of work to do to make it useful. But we get with persistent objects some examples. Distributed identities, right? You see some nodding from the, from the people who know here. Uh, the login is messy. Authentication is horrible. Uh, it's worse than horrible. And, and, and you know, what do you do? Like Facebook, Twitter, you can't even talk to other people in other systems. You have two completely different identities. We want one identity for one person, but without a police state, right? And, and that's part of the trick. So it has to be a distributed system, it has to be a personal system, etc. Really important. <clears throat> Open educational resources. You might say, well, what does that have to do with the metaverse? Well, imagine every open educational resource was a, a distinct and knowably distinct, unique resource, and its identity was based on its content. It's called content-based addressing. Um, so now you can create entire graphs of open educational resources. But the main thing here is you've solved the problem of authorship, you've solved the problem of provenance, citations, attributions, and all the rest. So that your resource, you don't need licenses and stuff like that. Your resource is open because it was made an open resource and nobody can change that fact later. Badges and credentials. Yeah, and again, uh, you want a system in education where if somebody gets a credential, it's a real credential, they can't create their own credentials, they don't, the credentials don't go away just because you owe the university money 20 years later. <laughs> Speaking from experience. <laughs> so, you get the idea, right? All of that works with AI, or will work with AI. That's just one. The second one is blockchain. And you should be going, no, not blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, there's Bitcoin and Ethereum and financial markets and all of that stuff. And it's that's all, well, very scammy, very, Flaky, I wouldn't trust it. I have never bought 
a single digital coin in my life, and I won't because it's a scam, right? It's the financial markets doing what the financial markets do. But the technology behind blockchain is really cool and really interesting. For example, I mentioned content-based addressing just a few seconds ago, right? Remember that? So you have an address that's tied to the content of a resource. Now you take that address, you make that part of the next resource, and now you have a new resource that contains the address, and now you give that an address that's based on the content in the previous address. I've just described blockchain to you. That, that's what blockchain is. Right, so you're able to chain these uniquely addressed resources together to form, well, maybe a chain, but in the future more likely a graph. We already use these today. These, these exist. Um, how many of you have heard of GitHub? GitHub is 100% based on that system. It's called a, um, a directional acyclic graph or DAG. And, and that's how it keeps track of all the branches and the changes. And that's why you're doing all that stuff with commits and pushing is to make that bit work. Um, lots of other stuff similarly uses content-based addressing networks to create these kind of things. This is leading now to distributed systems. Distributed systems are really important. Uh, distributed system, well, I'll give you an example. You know what went wrong with Facebook and Twitter, right? Uh, one centralized system owned by one evil billionaire, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden you're getting served up posts promoting Nazis and police states. It, it goes south really quickly um, if it's not managed properly. Sometimes even if it is managed properly. Uh, all kinds of other problems with it too. So people are developing alternatives to these closed centralized social networks called federated social networks or as it's usually called the Fediverse. So it's interesting, right? The Metaverse, the Fediverse. And the Fediverse question? Uh, yeah, quickly. I, I that's true. That, that was my technical response. <laughs> Fediverse captures what's happening in a way that Omniverse doesn't, right? Uh, and Omniverse could refi could refer to a pile of rubble, right? But a Fediverse implies, importantly, that each individual social network is connected with other social networks. And that's how the Fediverse works. So there's a social network called Mastodon. Actually, Mastodon is a type of technology. It's named after the, not the rock band, but the great big elephant like thing. And there are different instances of Mastodon and they connect to each other. And you need all this kind of pure networky sort of stuff to keep the whole system hanging together. I'm not gonna get into the tech of it because it's not important to this talk. But what is important is you can have these distributed connected networks of stuff all interoperating. That's important because when we think about AI, especially these days, look at what we're thinking of. We're thinking of the great big monster that is open AI, the great big monster that is Google Genesis. That's the current name for it. Uh, great big monster that is uh, whatever, right? But really down the line, that's not what AI is going to be. It's not going to be a great big system you work with. It's going to be a whole bunch of separate systems all interoperating together. That should really change a lot of what you're thinking about AI. And I haven't even gotten to talking about AI yet. So far, so good? 
Okay. And the third piece is AI. It does a whole bunch of stuff for us. We, we saw a bit of a description in the previous talk about how it works. Um, and, and, and a bit of a description or a bit of an account of some of the ethics. If you go, if you follow, oh, not this one. Oh, never mind. I did not say that. Let's start that <laughs> sentence again. <laughs> this and the previous two slides can be found at this link on the bottom of this slide, which is why I gave you the link for the slides. And that's a whole other presentation, building out these three diagrams. So all the stuff in these diagrams actually refers to things, and, and all of that is drawn out, explained, and applied to a learning context. But that's a totally different subject. So let's focus now on artificial itself. So, there have been a billion different ways of describing what AI does. This is my way. My way is the right way. Um, okay, maybe just more right than other right ways. But, uh, so, what I've done here and, and I actually did the, this is from a course that I did called Eth um, Ethics, Analytics, and the Duty of Care. Um, it's, it's a course on AI ethics. Uh, this particular slide is in this particular presentation. So you can go to that if you want. The main URL is ethics.mooc.ca. <coughs> And so a lot of the details on how AI works, the sorts of things AI can do, et cetera, are discussed in quite a bit more detail. But again, that course came out before um, OpenAI came out with chat, GPT, and the rest. That's why I say, yeah, it's easy to predict this stuff because most of that stuff, except the exact names, I didn't get the exact names, is in this course. You don't like the echo? <laughs> I just realized it. I've been working with this echo all along. It's <laughs> not That's what you call being a pro. <laughs> <laughs> my still echoes, by the way. Um, my way of dealing with maybe it's on my computer. Yeah, it's It doesn't matter. Uh, mine isn't based on the, the, the types of things that it does so much, you know, just trying to imagine, well, what could it do? Call a cab, plan a vacation. Uh, my, mine is actually based in what we might call the logic of grammar. Think about it, right? Uh, Grammar, that useless subject you took in grade school or sometimes known as grammar school, uh, it deals with tenses, verb tenses, past, present, future, different types of futures. It also deals with modalities, could, should, may, might, etc. You know, all the different tenses for verbs, right? So I used a bunch of those tenses, not all of them. But but you can imagine how I could use others, like you know the history of AI. I didn't do that, so I'm not worried about the past tense. Um, but so, and, and I kind of focused on analytics proper, but and with with a very broad conception of it. And so I got six major categories. The questions that we look at, well. What happened, or you know, what is happening now, present? What kind of thing is happening? Classification. What will happen? So, present, future, kind of. Make it happen. A whole causal logic. Make something new. And what should happen? 
So the first four were already current in the literature when I created this course, so I just borrowed those terms from other authors. Descriptive AI, diagnostic AI, predictive AI, <laughs> prescriptive AI. The next one was new when I wrote it, but it's all the age now. Generative AI. And the last one nobody's talking about yet, but they will. Deontic AI. What should happen? It's when AI starts telling you what to do instead of you telling it what to do. You don't think that's going to happen? What do you do when you log in? Follow the instructions on your screen, right? It's a very simple example of a computer telling you what to do, but you do it. You do it because you won't get access otherwise. In each of these, there's, there's all kinds of different subsets of AI. Uh, I'm not going to go into them. I'm not going to go into these in detail. I could. <laughs> In, in the course that I did a few years ago, that was one of the modules, right? This was the first part of it, and I spent the next week, okay, we'll go through this and this and this and this and this, because I'm thorough that way. You'll see this. But, you know, descriptive AI, systems analysis, institutional compliance, student profiles, right? Des describing things, all the different ways you can describe things. What kind of thing happened? Diagnosis? Diagnostic, spam detection, proctoring, that evil company Proctorio. <laughs> yes. Boo, hiss, hiss. We don't <laughs> like them. Uh, fakes detection, which we do like when it works. Sentiment analysis. Right. Predictive, what's going to happen. Uh, resource planning, learning design, user testing. Identify students at risk of failing. This was all of analytics three years ago. They, they couldn't think of anything else. How do you predict that a student's going to fail? Well, maybe if they did the work. Uh, <laughs> you know. uh, making it happen, um, learning recommendations, adaptive learning paths, uh, placement something something, hiring pricing. <laughs> Generative AI, this is what everybody's talking about now, chatbots, AI-generated content. I did a whole paper on AI-generated open educational resources set up in a content addressable resource network. I called it con Content Addressable Resources for Education, or CARE. But that has nothing to do with the CARE in ethics analytics and the duty of CARE. It's just a neat acronym. No, I went nowhere. But you know, five, ten years from now, it'll be a thing. What should happen? Well, community standards. AI could determine what your community standards are, probably more accurately than, say, the premier of the province. Uh, identifying the bad, amplifying the good, defining what's fair. Um, the United States has a big gerrymandering problem in, in uh, political districting, use an AI to design, you know, with, with agreed upon parameters to design the system of congressional districts. It'll completely change their election results. <laughs> Changing the lot, content moderation, easing distress, the AI that really does care. Um, you might think an AI won't care, but an AI won't judge you. Well, unless we ask it to, but generally an AI won't judge you. That goes a long way. All right. So, that's the overview of AI. Right? Pretty similar to what you just saw in the previous uh, presentation, right? A lot of overlap, just organized slightly differently. It's the organization that's really the key here. Just as an aside, education is a discipline that loves taxonomies. Uh, I'm not a taxonomy lover at all. Um, taxonomies are useful, but unless a taxonomy is principled and based in something like, say, English grammar, or <laughs> has a practical purpose, there's no reason to do it, right? Um, previous, now, 
I really liked the previous presentation, and there was the one bit um, from the Swedish author, Bild, no good with names, um, who did the, uh, the three types of education, the uh, qualification, socialization, and anyone? Because I've forgotten it. Subjectification, yeah, that's it. It's just a taxonomy, but it's a useful taxonomy if you keep in mind that most education is only doing the first two, or the first one mainly. Maybe a little bit of the second if you're in one of the elite Ivy League universities. Hardly ever the third. But yeah, that's really interesting to me. But, you know, simply dividing the purposes of education that way doesn't do anything. But actually applying that and, and asking, okay, well, how can that be used to change what we're doing? How can that be used to change what our focus is? Then it becomes interesting and important. But yeah, overall, too many taxonomies, not enough cause and effect in education generally. Um, I'm old school that way. My background was as a philosopher of science. Can you tell? Um, <laughs> And so these, these issues matter to me, you know, like issues of what counts as evidence, uh, you know, what is the reason why we're doing the thing that we're doing, all of that matter to me. And all of that lead to the creation of diagrams like this. So this is the part where I'm talking about being a futurist. Okay, continuing back with our regularly scheduled subject. <laughs> all right, so we got three, more than three actually by the time we're done, monstrosities ahead of us enterprise learning systems now i think saul was just giving me a list but i took that list seriously and made that the content of the presentation just in case that is actually what he wanted um so i'm going to go over those now keep in mind these are big huge pieces of software they're, they've got multiple components, tons of moving parts. At their core, they're pretty simple. But because they're dealing with thousands and thousands of students for a given institution, they get complex in a hurry. I'm going to try to keep the complexity to a minimum and focus on what they do. Now, there's a risk there, right? The, the risk is maybe I'm not addressing what's really important about enterprise learning systems, but that's the direction I've chosen to go. Sometimes you just gotta choose. So, learning management system. You've probably all used one, haven't you? Yeah. What do you use, D2L here? No, no, Moodle. Moodle, oh, okay. Oh, man, Moodle. There's a blast, oh, no, never mind. <laughs> Pardon? We just upgraded. Just upgraded. Well, well we have a more open source. <laughs> so, okay, well, all, the, all of these parts will be familiar to you, right? Uh, so, well, except admin controls, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> so, you're, you're going to have online course materials. You're going to have learn, tracking of learning. You're going to have a testing system with new and improved metrics, probably. <laughs> offline course material, you know, so maybe a link to the library or whatever. Communication, web, mobile. Moodle does have discussion capabilities. That's nice. A lot of LMSs don't. Especially the LMSs that they made for MOOCs, and they call them MOOC systems, like Coursera and Udacity. They're just LMSs with cloud-based backend so they can handle hundreds of thousands of people and no discussion because that's hard. I don't want to criticize them, but they're, they're a bit more up to date now, but that's what they were when they came out. So that, that's basically a learning management system. That's what it does, right? And then the whole idea is that it gives you as a student access to these things, access to the materials, access to the testing, and then it'll track you, and hopefully it'll be connected into other systems like the student information system or whatever. True? But so. So that's, the, that's all I want to say about the LMS. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> Learning.
learning experience platform is an LMS with attitude. Did quite a bit of work over the years with Desire to Learn. Good company, good people, I like them. I like the Moodle people too. But, um, they changed their branding from a learning management system to a learning experience platform. And they, they go red in the face, well not literally, but when you refer to them as an LMS, no, we're a learning experience platform, the same technology. All right. But again, it's got parts. All right, we've got our learner again. So here's the, and it's really hard to read, LXP, LMXP, or similar one-stop shop competency-based learning journeys. For example, degree, sum total, uh, at NRC, we use, what do we use, Skillsoft. Uh, we have other names for it. <laughs> and so here, here are some of the things, right? External content, adaptive learning. Uh, this is old style adaptive learning where it was basically, it was basically very primitive machine learning until very recently, the AI in these systems is really primitive. A uh, coaching platform. Here's a link to the LMS. For example, success factors. Oh, I think we use success. No, I don't. Uh, gaming, which you're not really supposed to acknowledge. Uh, whiteboarding, etc. But also down here, we've got. It's called a data lake. And if you're wondering what the technical term, technical meaning of data lake is, you take all of your data. Just put it in a big repository, that's a data lake. So, but your data lake is useful because you do some analysis and stuff like that. You organize it, sort it, filter it, flake it, form it, and then that will create for you a data mart. And a data mart is one shop stopping for all your data needs. But that really kind of goes outside the realm of a learning experience platform. But there is a data lake, and the data lake is used by all of these systems. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then down here, the content creation bit, and the purple other button. So, yes, of course. Uh, that's a good question. Let's have a look. So, content creation, for example, articulate podcast videos, etc. And content creation on the red nucleus, illuminate ERS proficient learning and whole systems, etc. I have no idea why those are separate. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I thought I, when you asked, I thought, okay, well, maybe one box refers to formal learning resources uh, called uh, SCORM, shareable um, course object, uh, shareable, yeah, shareable courseware object reference model, I think. Yeah, got it, good. It's been a while. <laughs> right, so actual packaged learning resources. And then I thought the other one might be just stuff you, you created on the fly, like a, a lecture recording like we're doing here or something. But the no. on the right there, those are all content developing companies, yeah. right? Maybe ah. division. They're in the pharma space, so they'll end the pharma. So they must have been the ones who developed that. So you probably have licensed content versus just, you know, like it's like Scorpio. Licensed content versus content you created in house. Perfect. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Didn't occur to me, but yeah, how about that? Love ways problems get solved sometimes. It's just here's another picture of a digital experience platform, right? And the main reason for this picture is to is to underline the idea that these are kind of fluid concepts, right? Uh, you know, not every LMS is exactly the same. Not every LX, LXP is exactly the same. So uh, they, they're going to have slightly different components. 
But more or less, you know, we have interfaces, pieces of software. We have experience APIs, which I'll talk, which I'll talk about, and user or UX user experience design systems. So that's what you use to actually create the shell or the template of, of your uh, learning experience. Again, I'm, there's more details there. Supporting digital platforms. So social management, conversation management, payment gateway. Ooh, yes. Uh, digital intelligence, uh, contents and digital assets, etc. And then the integration and data layer to enterprise integration platforms. And then down here at the bottom, as usual, your data platforms. They call it data platforms and then data, data domain. But really, you know, it's data lakes, data marks, whatever. There's a, there's a whole science of that. That's all I want to say about learning experience platforms. You kind of get the idea? Details aren't that important, but the, the overall thing is important. What, what's the difference between a learning management system and a learning experience platform? Is the one is old school content management and teaching. The other one is more about creating a learning experience with different kinds of resources, different kinds of services, so that you're not stuck in the one single system. And again, that's a fast and loose distinction between the two. Third, and oh, the, the venture capitalists love this. Talent management systems. <laughs> yeah. Every large enterprise has a talent management system. Your university probably has one. Do they have one here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, it's the thing, they call it talent management system. It, it's the thing that handles the whole human resources function. I mean, a lot of organizations, including my own, uh, training, learning, development is considered a human resource function, not core to the institution the way it should be. Um, so some of the things, well, planning, but recruitment, employee onboarding, Performance management, this is actually on the job, not taking tests, right? <laughs> Compensation management, the uh, big thing about the government of Canada and Phoenix, compensation management. Did it work? No. <laughs> Does it work? Uh, I'm getting paid, but it took three years to register that I moved from New Brunswick to Ontario back in 2015. <laughs> and then learning a professional development. So you get the idea, right? The simplest diagram of any of them that I could find. I tried, this is the diagram I used to try to get ChatGPT to organize, because I wanted something like this for artificial intelligence, right? Diagnostic, da -da 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 -da. but no, it gave me that abomination you saw on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's put it all together. So this is my rough and ready diagram. So the learning management system, basically about learning management, right? Course contents, testing, tracking people, keeping track of your grades, stuff like that. Um, here, off the chart, we might have a student information system, um, although in a corporate enterprise that will be handled over in the TMS. Also off the chart, we might have what used to be called an LCMS, Learning Content Management System. Those are all the rage for a few years. But yeah, some sort of content authoring. This is where we'll have our, I guess, our, our two types of, you know, the content producing companies, and the in-house content creation systems, articulate, stuff like that. Okay. Learning experience platform really is kind of at the center of everything. Um, when, now, I'm not talking about personal learning so much in this talk, 
But when we talked about building a personal learning environment, it was this, except based on a person, not an institution. This is based on the institution, and it connects to the learning management system using SCORM. Um, it'll connect to a login or authentication system. Um, do you use EduRoom here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So EduRoom, it might, it might connect you into EduRoom. Shibboleth is another popular one. Never really got the hang of Shibboleth, to be honest. It's, it's, yeah. So uh, there's a thing down here called a learning, learning or learner record store, LRS. And XAPI uh, called the Experience API, which is kind of you know the learning experience platform. Experience API uh, used to be called Tin Can, and then some company trademarked the name Tin Can. So the entire discipline said, "Well, now it's XAPI." <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely what happened. I'm not making it up. So. Uh, and other APIs, okay, so here's our talent management system. It'll be linked to the learning experience platform. It'll be, you know, it'll tie into all the employment records in that. And, oh yeah, this is the credential store. I looked for an abstract representation of a credential store and I didn't actually find one, which I thought was kind of interesting. Maybe there's an opportunity for work there. Uh, and again, these connect in. So this is your badging system. Uh, your degree system, any, anything, uh, your skills profile, your, your portfolio, anything that relates to your actual learning credentials. This overall is a rough, very high level approximation of enterprise learning systems. This is years in development. Uh, millions of dollars for the different pieces of this and like this is the top layer and then behind this well it, i've got a page at the end of the presentation on uh, what did i call it advanced issues or further issues or whatever where i'll talk about some of the stuff that lies behind all of this but this is the superficial level the user facing level we might say any questions on this part yes any This is based on the way I registered it. It's based on the, it's not based on the individual, it's based on the enterprise. Uh -huh. That's how I understand yeah. it. Can you explain more? Yeah. Just trying to come up with a metaphor. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, okay. Think of third-party applications, like say, a discussion list, um, Discourse. Discourse is a wonderful discussion list software. It sits alone on its own server, right? It has discussion channels and threads and things like that. Now, that's the sort of service that an LXP might connect to, right? Because you want to give your students or your participants access to a discussion list. Now, if it's based on the enterprise, then your access to this discussion list is almost always, like 99% of the time, exclusive to people who are in this enterprise. So it's the, you know, it's the Ryerson discussion list. Is there such a thing? Oh, we're not at Ryerson. Mm -hmm. Concordia. Yeah, we're at Concordia. Ryerson doesn't exist anymore. It's Toronto. Right. I told you, I'm not good with names. <laughs> Very honest. Does Concordia have a discussion? They, they've gone out of fashion recently because people actually yeah, use them to communicate. Them, but they're very specialized and not for everyone. They're very specialized and not for everyone. Yeah, that, that's pretty typical. Yeah. 
Government of Canada, same thing, right? Uh, Government of Canada has a thing called uh, GC Connect, which is uh, a Government of Canada uh, discussion area for employees. And then there's a whole bunch of sub forums and things like that. It's very extensive. Um, you'd get into it using your, your uh, credentials and you go into this. So that's the enterprise focused one. But what about all those people who aren't university students, don't work for a big company, don't work for the government, right? Where do they go? Well, they could go to Reddit, <laughs> all right? But really, I, you know, I mean, it's like they have to go to these standalone discussion areas. But they want to learn too. They want access to all of the you know, learning contents and such. So we set up a special environment that we call a PLE. That's just for one person. And that person will still log into their own PLE with their own credentials. But now when they log into the discussion list, they log in as themselves. Now it's not just a discussion list with one person. That would be useless. So other people using their own PLEs log into it as well, with their own credentials. So it's distributed, right? One discussion list, multiple accesses. Uh, amber? I, I always want to do bats, right? Is it amber? Is it a tornado? Is it... <laughs> what do we got? Amber. Amber, okay. I think they're in here. Yeah. yeah. I'm in Ontario, Eastern Ontario. Well, actually, not even that far from Montreal. You get Amber Alerts like from Thunder Bay. I'm serious. <laughs> And, and, and the kid's been missing, you know, I mean, it's a serious subject. And of course, we support Amber Alerts, but maybe those that are located near us. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's an hour old and they've been missing for like an hour and we're not even a one hour flight from Thunder Bay. Okay, where was I? Oh, yeah, um, PLE. One system for an individual person, multiple people accessing the discussion list. The problem with PLEs, as I've just described it, they don't really exist. So annoying. It's something that I've been working on for years and years and years. Really hard. I mean, you think enterprise technology is hard. Try <coughs> distributed learning technology. That's hard. And, and there's no market for it, which is what really makes it hard. But uh, you know, places like Concordia will pay millions of dollars for a learning experience platform. Nobody will pay for a personal learning environment. Who's going to pay for it? So there's the problem. But the concept is there. Question? Um, there's something like GC Connects that we mentioned where government employees use their government Yep. If the if the GC Connect allows it to happen, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are some. There's GC Collab that actually is set up that way. There's still no personal learning environment, but members of the public can log into it using their own credentials and actually talk with government employees. And then again, there are different subgroups and discussions and things like that. If you're curious, yeah, look it up. GC Collab. There's a whole bunch of stuff like that, you know, and people don't talk about it, but it exists. Not to tout the government or anything, because I, I wouldn't really, but the last three years especially, they've gone from Stone Age digital technology to almost mainstream. It's been incredible. They've done a lot. And nobody sees it, but they've done a lot. Uh, a lot of it was caused by the pandemic, right? Which is why so many people are really upset that now 
they're, they're being forced to return to the office because that's where the technology doesn't work. <laughs> it works better at home. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I go into the office. Oh, my internet's going to be slow if it's up. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I can get myself in trouble here. <laughs> but if they fire me, I get severance. <laughs> Six of one, half dozen of the other. Now, this is the interlude. I hope I'm sort of at halfway. No. <laughs> How am I doing on time? Um, you've got about 17 minutes. <laughs> I really hope this was interesting to this point because cause this was supposed to be the halfway mark. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. but but it wasn't, you know, I mean, like I say, I sometimes promise to follow the agenda. Okay, this is the interlude. Here's how we predict. Uh, just as an aside, which I can't really afford with 17 minutes. <laughs> there's so many, you, you talk to futurists and they, they create these four quadrant scenarios, right? To me, that's fake futurism, right? What they're doing is they're creating um, one range of possibilities, another range of possibilities, right? Giving a square for each quadrant and giving it a cute name. And the quadrant in the upper right, that's what they really want you to do. It, it's more of a marketing device than anything. I, I don't do that. I think predictions should be clear, precise, and accurate. I don't do the scenario thing. But do that. I mean, it's the future. It hasn't happened yet. Well, I used to say long, long ago, and I still say it today, we read the future the same way we read the past. Right? We look at the signs. We look at the data we've got. We've got tons of data, especially now, right? We can predict the future really easily, you know, like uh, like they're going to kick me out of this room sometime, <laughs> within, sometime within the next hour, I'm going to be asked to leave, right? Guaranteed to happen. Um, you know, all kinds of things. The sun will come up tomorrow. The trains will continue to be late. Actually, Via Rail is pretty good for on time these days for me, but again, brand new train. took a brand new train. Anyhow, so... What do we got? You got the learning management, learning experience, talent management, three systems that I've just described in some level of detail to you. Those exist. We've got artificial intelligence, metaverse, blockchain. Those are types of technology that exist today that I've just described in a little bit of detail for you. Those exist. So the futurism is what's in these boxes. Easy. <laughs> I told you, it's not rocket surgery. <laughs> so let's get a little narrower. So this is where the taxonomy kind of comes useful in organizing your thoughts, just like grammar. Diagnostic da, 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 for learning management system, learning experience platform, talent management system. The predictions are in the boxes. So far, so good. Okay. I'm actually going to make this in 17 minutes, but we're not going to get the breakouts, I'm afraid. Hope that's okay. Let's go even narrower because we have the details we need. Right? There's the, all the types of AI across the top. But it doesn't really matter how you break it down, just break it down rationally. You know, use basic principles of categorization. Um, you know, you know, each category should refer to all and only something. All and only something. They shouldn't cross categorize, right? The the the, the standard way of producing a tech taxonomy is to show how they're the same and how they're different from the other things. But you know, there's many ways of producing a taxonomy. 
I like to use grammar because grammar is connected to logic. Logic is connected to cause and effect. There's probably going to be something useful there. And down the side, we have the elements of the learning management system. I've picked out three just for exposition. Course materials, testing of learning, tracking of learning. Simple, right? So now, how could I use artificial intelligence, descriptive artificial intelligence, for course materials? Any thoughts? Pardon? Let's hear one. Well, you want to create like a smaller, you know, version of all the calendar of learning materials. Yeah. It's kind of a summarizing function, but yeah. I'm thinking um, one of the big challenges, and this was a huge challenge in the early 2000s, was learning object metadata. People have forgotten it now. <laughs> so learning object metadata is data about the, the learning object. So uh, what its title is, what format it's in, if it's a video, how long it is, if it's an image, what its dimensions are, what the typical age range is. There was a whole set of them. Learning object metadata, L-O-M, IEEE 14 something something. I think it's 1428, whatever. People, 57, 87, whatever, separate items that people use to describe learning resources. And their accuracy rate was pretty good, but you could count on there being errors. Have AI do it, create your own automated learning object metadata. So that you don't have to classify your learning resources anymore. Your AI is looked at, or that's a PDF, that's an image. This is about cowboys, this is about firemen, whatever. Do that for each box. It's easy, I didn't say it was quick. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's my prediction. Sorry about the script, but I just kind of wanted to make it clear. So for course materials, for descriptive, count word, word frequencies, how many reads was there? Uh, how many notes? You know, just anything, anything that describes the uh, material. Uh, you might think, well, that's not very interesting. Well, think about, and they were they were just showing it on, um, you know, when uh, Chat GPT O came out. Yeah, four O. Four O. One of the things it does is that. You ask it, what am I looking at? And it describes the scene in front of you. All of a sudden, descriptive is cool again. Right. So, you know, uh, okay, for the next one, uh, it's hard to read. Diagnostic, so classify the resources, identify topics, extract keywords, automated and keyword extraction. Oh, that would save me typing six words. No, I'm just kidding. That, I hate doing keywords. It's editors always come back and say, please add keywords to your article. I'm sorry. Sort of, rate, quality, etc. Um, course materials for, uh, I think that's predictive. Assess readability. Give it a readability score. You've actually seen systems that do that, probably. All right? Prescriptive. Do content recommendations. Learning path planning. Right. For uh, generative, create novel content. AI that writes course materials for you. It is coming. You know, you might be saying, well, yeah, but what about the hallucinations and all of that? Well, that's why I started this talk with the metaverse and blockchain. The metaverse and the blockchain keep you honest, right? You can't hallucinate if you have to refer to actually existing objects, right? There's already some of that. They, they, it's in, in AI, you have your, your model, and then you give it a quote-unquote context in which you're going to use it. That's, that's how they're using that term at the moment. And the context can actually be like an entire paper, an entire library of papers 
written by somebody. And then the instruction in the prompt, which is the third part, actually part of the context, but the third part, say, do not vary from the facts stated in the context. And then your AI is not going to make stuff up. It has stuff it has to use. So that, as we apply uh, persist, uh, persistent objects and, and uh, content-based addressing, things like that, our AI gets more and more accurate. So accurate, in fact, it will cor correct us rather than us correcting it. Count on it, it's coming. Think about your relation with a calculator. How often do you question what the calculator tells you? Sometimes you should, but usually if you add it in your head and you look at the calculator and they're two different numbers, you figure the calculator was probably right. Question? Uh, I work with programmers in an agile environment. Yep. On an basis. Yep. Um, will AI also facilitate uh, course updates and course, uh, course accuracy? So that, say, of course, it was drafted a week ago, changes all of a sudden, boom, you know, identify those changes for me, or I need to implement them, or? Short answer is, and you, you know, next week you'll still have to implement it. Right. Ten years from now, it'll all be automatic, because your AI will be tie, tied into um, um, the, the global linked data network. Uh, web of it used to be called Web of Data. Now oh, there's there's an acronym. It's not Global Link Data Network, but that's basically what I'm talking about. But yeah, absolutely. And how will you know that what it's getting from this data network is accurate? Every piece of data will be tagged with a unique identifier that can be traced using a blockchain back to the person who put it in the system. It's coming. It's, it's most of the, all of the, all of the pieces already exist. Easy to make the prediction. figure out where instructional designers live in this world where you're talking about, you know, that internet and knowledge. So is it, do you think it's instructional designers will become the gatekeepers of what gets to be considered tagged and trusted and referred? So is that something that we should be thinking of as a, the brand of an instructional designer and somebody who can actually do it for decades already, yeah. packaging learning objects now into another large, larger school system? Short term, yes. Long term, no. Yeah, long term, that function becomes completely automated. Count on it. Yeah, and you think, so we, you do this systematically, right? Now I've, I've got, now when I had more than five minutes left, now it's three minutes, uh, <laughs> I was going to break you all into groups and you're each going to do one of these. So I'll leave that as an exercise for you. But here are the, oh, before we before we even get to that. After you do the boxes, here's one, right? Now ask the important questions. This is what makes you a futurist, right? What problem does this solve? It might not solve any problem. That's not necessarily a problem. Lots of things don't solve problems are still really useful. What new thing can we do? That's usually the really useful thing, right? We weren't able to fly before. Now we can fly. You know, we didn't really solve a problem with airplanes. It wasn't a real problem. But now we can go to the Bahamas anytime we want. Wasn't an issue before. What needs to exist to make this possible? Some of you should be thinking about Marshall McLuhan here. What does this replace? What does this amplify, etc.? Similar sort of set of questions. What would make this impossible? Right? Many people say many things about AI are impossible, but you get right down to the box and ask what would make this impossible, and you learn there's far fewer things make any aspect of our AI impossible than people think. It's when people talk in broad generalizations that it all seems like magic get into the little boxes, it's not magic at all. And then here, who or what would be harmed? 
important question to ask, obviously. That's not necessarily going to stop people, but if you're the school management, right? If you're a cold hearted business person, that's opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the, the your turn thing. So here are the topics. Again, it's an, an exercise, and then we're going to come back. And here are my predictions. You can read through these on your own because you have access to those slides. And, but you can, and you look at each one of these boxes, each of the different types of AI, all of these predictions become really obvious and hard to resist. And the point I was trying to make here is you could have come up with them, you didn't need me at all. All you had to do was organize stuff properly. Now, the pro tip. This is a pro tip. This is what the pros do for the big bucks. And it's really interesting. And, and I hope you'll indulge me just a wee bit. I got a great story that won't close with this. Okay, so these are all the boxes that I created in all those previous slides, right? So you connect them together because there's a workflow. And you, you can fairly easily identify the workflow in enterprise learning management systems. And now you look at each one of these little boxes and tell yourself what would happen. Now, what I've done is I've framed this and I did this like a few days ago. So using AI to support staff diversity at Institution P, that's my framing, right? So I've just picked that out of the air. Now, the funny thing is when I came to the conference today, I went to the wrong conference. <laughs> I went to the accessibility. accessibility across Canada conference and I thought, gee, that's pretty interesting that Saul didn't tell me that <laughs> there, there was an accessibility focus to this, but I'm really glad I chose the example that I did. It'll look like I planned for it. And I'd look like a real genius. <laughs> but, but now you have the story, right? You're assessing and pre-screening incoming applications. So that allows you to be selective. Now you're, you're recommending training materials, policies, goals for that person, specific for that person. You're also redefining your acceptance logic for registration, for sign-in or employment, and recommending for target groups. Because of the demographics, you know how to improve success rates. So you're creating custom content, images, videos, etc. You're able to assess the readability of that. So you can create test assessment rubrics, etc., specific to the person uh, that's being assessed. Again, staff diversity, right? So how to improve that success rate? We're also going to identify areas of strength, weaknesses, topic preferences for that person. We're also going to do learning path recommendations. And to help them out, we're going to identify compatible discussion lists and put them in touch with correspondents and mentors who will help them out. Um, we can predict what their role in, their con in these conversations will be in areas where they'll be successful. So that allows us to design a custom user interface design for them. And we can talk about what their responses would be for specific experience designs or identify optimal presentation styles, um, digital modalities, etc. especially for people who need have accessibility needs. That leads us to a recommended metadata profile, data requirements, etc. So the, we can predict what their data needs will be, what their data will be produced, takes us down to being able to predict the sorts of requests that they'll make, what kind of demand that they'll put on the system. We can also, therefore, recommend what external sources of data and sources of truth, that's the formal name that database analysts use for that, uh, you know, the web of data, the, the verified data. And that will also suggest what their individual performance indicators should be, again, supporting diversity. 
and that'll help us generate performance assessments, formative training, and recommend a compensation profile specific to that individual. That is the sort of futurism that you can do if you nail down all the details. And you can be very specific, you can flesh out each one of these. Uh, you've got yourself a grade A, compensa uh, grade a um, consultant's report. That's what instructional designers will be doing in the future. Not designing instruction. Who would do that? Computers can do that. You don't need that anymore. What you do need is this story. Right? Be able to tell this story. If you can tell this story, you'll earn your salary. If, if, if you can design a web page, not so much. Wider issues, management and analytics. We talked a little bit about that. The enterprise workflow and evolving needs, identity, identity, identity. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for an outstanding presentation. You did address what I was hoping you would. But I want to share a lesson I learned many years ago from a boss of mine. It says, you never schedule anything before lunch <laughs> if you don't want to compete with it. And since lunch is what's on the agenda next, nothing personal, but it's hard to compete with that. Yeah, it's yeah, talking. <laughs> for those of you, it's, you go down where you registered, right behind that's a beautiful open area. Now you'll find your seat there. So I invite you to go, and we will see you back here at 201 in the afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Just let me turn everything off here. So on Wednesday, I'll be doing a short presentation on all concentration. Oh, yeah. And that's why I haven't, uh, I haven't finalized the topic for my dissertation, but I'm playing with the area. But I was like having a discussion with you.